Hi. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, it's my great pleasure and privilege to introduce today's speakers. Um, Elizabeth Alcesser, Liz Alcesser, has been since 2012 an assistant professor in the media school at Indiana University, Bloomington, as well as an affiliate faculty member in the Department of Gender and Women's Studies in the Cultural Studies program. However, she will be starting a position in the Department of Media Studies at the University of Virginia um, very, very shortly. Uh, Liz works at the intersection of cultural media, uh, cultural studies, media studies, and disability studies. Her research and teaching interests include media history, access, and literacy, as well as social media, participatory culture, celebrity, and performance of the self. Um, she is the author of Restricted Access, Media, Disability, and the Politics of Participation from NYU Press last year, and co-editor with Bill Kirkpatrick of Disability Studies Meets Media Studies, or Disability Media Studies, sorry, <laughs> um, which is forthcoming from NYU. Meryl Alper is an assistant professor of communication studies at Northeastern University and a faculty associate here at the Berkman Klein Center. Um, and prior to joining the faculty of Northeastern, she earned her doctorate um, and master's degrees from the Annenberg School of Communication and Journalism at the University of Southern California. Merrill has worked for over a decade in children's media industry. As an undergraduate at Northwestern, she was the lab assistant manager in the NSF-funded Children's Digital Media Center slash Digital Kids Lab. And she interned with the Education and Research Department at Sesame Workshop in New York. Maybe you've heard of it. <laughs> in post-graduation, she worked in the LA base, uh, in Los Angeles as a research manager for uh, Nick Jr. Uh, conducting formative research for the Emmy-nominated educational preschool television series Ni Hao Kai Ian and the Fresh Beat Band. Merrill is the author of Digital Youth with Disabilities, MIT Press 2014, and Giving Voice, available behind you, Mobile Communication, Disability, and Inequality, MIT Press this year. You may have also seen her writing in The Guardian, The Atlantic, Motherboard, and Wired. Ryan Budish is a senior researcher at the Berkman Klein Center. Ryan joined the Berkman Klein Center in 2011 as a fellow and the project director of Herdict. His, in his time uh, here, Ryan has contributed policy and legal analysis to a number of projects and reports, and he's led several significant initiatives relating to internet censorship, corporate transparency about government surveillance, and multi-stakeholder governance mechanisms. I should also say, um, Merrill and Liz have each published outstanding books in the past year. Um, they're uh, in the center of my field, at least. And while Giving Voice by Merrill and Restricted Access by Liz offer rigorous analyses of sort of lives lived with disability uh, in the 21st century, they're also offering very fundamental reconsiderations of what it means to study media and communication and technology. And um, both books are totally worth your time. Um, and it's a great privilege to have you all here today. So um, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Meryl, and um, we'll start today's event. Okay, great. Okay. Oh, will help. Awesome. Uh, so Liz and I will be playing off one another a little bit in the sense that uh, each of our books focuses particularly on a, on a key term, mind, voice, and, and Liz's access. And so the, as you might have read in the introduction to, to this event on the event site, can we talk, um, we think is a really evocative question, one that we'll pull in threads through each of our discussions, um, but thinking that it thinks, pulls upon ability, um, collective notions, and kind of actions of what it means to participate. So my presentation is, can we talk about voice? Um, so in, in my work, um, just to kind of also pull together some of um, what Dylan so graciously said, I study the social implications of communication technology with a focus on the role of digital and mobile media in the lives of young people, um, but particularly young people with developmental disabilities. Um, so that's in particular um, uh, autistic youth, and young people with uh, significant communication impairments, um, particularly related to something called childhood apraxia of speech, which is basically when the brain has difficulty coordinating the body parts that are needed to talk. 
So I think about communication across different, different levels. Um, so some of these young people, um, instead of talking in what you might think of as the traditional sense, uh, use something that's sort of like what Stephen Hawking, who's pictured in the, the, uh, um, in the above picture here, what he uses, but instead, um, nowadays, instead of having to, to necessarily use a device that is bigger, more expensive, um, breaks and takes a long time to replace, you could potentially use what I've pictured on the, the bottom here is, a, is an iPad with this one app called Prolo Quo to Go. And, and I will point here to the, to the screen. You can select text and icons, and it'll fill in this top white bar. And you can press the bar, and uh, speech will be output. Um, the, the language, the software is a little less sophisticated than what can be created in, in a you know, bigger computer than that, but it can do a lot of work. So for those unfamiliar, um, some of these technologies are called, sometimes they're called voice output communication aids, speech generating devices, or augmentative and alternative communication devices, which ironically is a mouthful to say. Um, so I'm just going to say AAC for, for shorthand in this talk. So because um, the users of these technologies um, like I mentioned, don't talk in the traditional sense. And because they use speech generating devices to communicate, uh, the popular press has historically referred to these types of technologies in a way in which the users of them get figured as voiceless. Um, so the top headline says, uh, it's from the Los Angeles Times, it says, electronic help for the handicapped, the voiceless break their silence. Uh, that's a headline about a technology called the Canon Communicator. So Canon, the company you might think of as cameras, produced a, a device that was specifically focused on, on voice and voice output, um, uh, or sorry, or electronic voice kind of generation. So voiceless here. 2012, pretty similar headline. Um, this is about the iPad giving voice to kids with autism. Uh, so, but the question I'm really interested in is, what does it mean for technology to give voice to the voiceless? And who does that phrase actually help or hurt in the process? So to answer that question, I'm going to discuss three things. I'm going to talk about, first, the broader significance of this phrase, giving voice to the voiceless. It's a phrase you might have heard, but not necessarily taken a critical angle towards. Um, why it's an important concept to critique, especially for people with disabilities. And third, how thinking differently about voice and voicelessness in this way, I think, can more broadly create meaningful change around technology and ethical considerations more broadly. Speaking of ethics, so before I go much further, I also want to make clear that I do not personally identify as having a disability. I'm also a white, cis, straight, upper middle class woman. So I'm sensitive to the power inherent in interpreting and sharing the experiences of others through my analytic lens. But I also believe that disability is at the heart of the human experience. Um, and I think this picture here um, some gets at that. So it's a picture taken by Tom Olin um, at an ADA march in the early 90s. Um, so people of various racial um, backgrounds, people with various um, uh, physical uh, and whatnot disabilities, marching under a banner uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s quote, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Um, so I think that there is an, uh, something that's really brought out in this picture is that despite structures that systematically, and, uh, systematically isolate and remove people with disabilities from the center of society, we have to think about uh, the ways in which, wh how we define what it is to be human. And then even within that, I would say, because there's the MLK quote here, about the intersections of disability with other kinds of identities and other potentialities for marginalization as well. So with that being said, what does it mean to give voice to the voiceless? What does giving voice mean? Um, so we might locate its origins biblically. Uh, so uh, in the New, New International Version, many different biblical you know, versions, Proverbs 31.8 says, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Um, so not only do you get illusions about voice and speaking, there's also a class dimension to this as well. Um, we might locate, um, in terms of how this is traced through different professional groups, different actors in the public sphere, um, journalists. So this is a screenshot of um, the Society of Professional Journalists, their code of ethics. 
Um, and one line from this says that journalists, a key journalistic duty is to be vigilant and courageous about holding those with power accountable. Give voice to the voiceless. Um, moving from just sort of actors to also thinking about um, other kinds of technologies, um, we can think about an endless list of things, whether it's civic media, Twitter, or open data as pictured here, um, as sort of giving voice. This is uh, from the Open Data Institute Summit 2015. Um, speaker's uh, talk is citizen empowerment, giving a voice to the voiceless. All too often, though, when we consider this background, disability becomes instrumental for another purpose outside of just disability-focused issues. Um, it tends to represent something broken for technology to repair. Um, so consider this is Microsoft's Super Bowl commercial uh, from 2014. So long after Apple had its, its big Super Bowl commercial in the 80s, it took until 2014 to Microsoft to, to have its entry point, and disability is front and center here. Um, it features NFL player Steve Gleason, who lost the ability to produce oral speech due to ALS. And the ad proclaims that the Microsoft Surface Pro, which is pictured here, has given voice to the voiceless. And this gets exemplified by Gleason himself providing the voiceover for the commercial. So we can say, and I, and I would encourage you, we don't have the time for me to play the commercial, but I encourage you to, to take a look at it um, in its entirety. But we can say then that, that giving voice to the voiceless means a couple of things. It means that voice, um, is used here as a metaphor for agency and self-representation. That voicelessness is imagined as a stable and natural category. So the voiceless is a thing that we can locate and as a sort of Im immutable thing. Um, and technology then gets figured as this sort of direct opportunity, this frictionless opportunity um, for expression. Uh, so there's a lot to critique about each of those um, kinds of claims. Um, but why do I think it's particularly important to do so, um, particularly at this moment in time? Um, so that's because, based on the ethnographic research that I conducted, despite these widespread claims to give voice to the voiceless, communication technologies that are intended to universally empower are still subject to disempowering structural inequalities, and especially for people with disabilities. Uh, so in my book, Giving Voice, pictured here and, and that back there, I argue that efforts to better include disabled individuals within society through primarily technological interventions, when all we do is fetishize and focus on the technology for whatever kind of commercial or affective reasons, we, we miss the opportunity to take into account all the other ways in which culture, law, policy, and even the design of these technologies themselves can marginalize and exclude. Uh, so the book is based on a 16-month ethnic ethnographic study that I conducted of, uh, of young people who use the iPad and that Prolo Quota Go app, kids about 3 to 13. Um, and I uh, spent some time ob observing them, getting trained on how to use the technologies at home with speech pathologists. Um, I followed them to different user groups that young people would use to talk to one another in. I went to parent conferences. I also started to interview different kinds of assistive technology administrators that, are in, that were in the local Southern California area, and lots of variations across kind of better, more resourced and less resourced school districts, larger and smaller ones, um, to get a sense of what were the other kinds of systems that were shaping the adoption, use, or potentially um, you know, non-use of these technologies. So in terms of culture, um, and I'm just gonna go through three examples kind of quickly, um, most speech generating devices um, are in English. Uh, the, the ones that are, that are given to kids in US schools. At home, that is not something that everybody uses to speak. Um, you automatically can create a disconnect there between what a, a, a home culture is and what a school culture is. So one specialist that I talked to said there are hundreds of languages in these schools. One of the kids I work with at home, his parents speak Korean. Any kind of assistive communication system, any kind of communication system, they wouldn't use it because they don't speak it. It's a big issue. We are stuck just doing school-based, which is fine, that's our job, but it's hard. It's hard to support them across the board because we can't. So we could say that here voice is you know, given, but then it's also simultaneously muted. Um, with respect to law, um, assistive technologies are also quite bluntly 
born of a wor world in which half of the people who die at the hands of police have a disability. There's a 2016 report from the Ruderman Family Foundation, if you want to take a greater look at that. But this is something that Danny's dad, Peter, tapped into um, when he talked about a, a fear of how a police officer might mistake his son reaching for his communication device as reaching for a weapon. Um, so he said, I need him to be able to gesture yes and no. If a cop's asking him questions and got a gun on him, no cop in the world's going to allow him to grab a talker. So this awareness um, of the limits of any given piece of technology in a particular context around justice and injustice um, uh, was something that participants were keenly aware of. That is not necessarily reflected in this broader discourse. Um, so giving voice can also run the risk of, of being silenced, and quite literally, permanently. Um, and lastly, all of this has to be understood in a larger policy backdrop. Um, so school district policies, what I found, is tend to promote um, their financial investments, protecting those, more so than promoting students' continued growth. Um, this is something that Moira's mom, Vanessa, relayed in, in a story. So in Southern California, kids have been throwing the iPads, apparently, into pools. This is what the, the mom was told. And because of that, the school decided that they were not going to allow the kids to take those iPads off campus, even though they were federally mandated to provide the child a, a way in which to communicate with others. So we're bounding that within the school. And the ability to challenge that is completely shaped by one's access to other kinds of resources, financial aid, legal assistance, social capital. Um, so Vanessa uh, had said to me, the school district changed their policy, said that iPads only remained on campus, which was in violation of Moira's IEP. I wrote them, she even wrote them, she said, this is in violation. I'm asking that you give me a window of opportunity to purchase her a device for the home. One morning I was like, I don't wanna send this iPad to school. I of course gave it to her and it didn't come home. So we could say here also, voice, yes, voice is given, but then it's taken away. So how, how, do I, how does this kind of one particular kind of case get at some of these larger frameworks, frameworks with which we understand technology and ethics. So my overall takeaway is that we should keep voices attached to people. Um, so I'm, I'm drawing here on, there's a historian, Catherine Ott, um, who's at the Smithsonian, um, written an introduction to this book. It's a, this is a picture of the cover of that book. It's called Artificial Parts, Practical Lives, Modern History of Prosthetics. And she writes, focus on the materiality of the body not only or exclusively its abstract and metaphoric meanings. Keeping prostheses attached to people limits the kinds of claims and interpretive leaps a writer can make. Um, so I think as well, staying very close to the body, staying very close to the material and embodied aspects of voice, is the only way for us to understand the uses and abuses of voice in relation to other kinds of inequalities and injustices. Um, I will just go through two applications of this um, in terms of what I use with my students to talk about politics in two ways. Politics and sort of big P politics, so like electoral politics, and little p politics, which is power, and, and it's sort of its various manifestations. And those two things are related to one another, but it's a simple way to kind of split it up. Um, trigger warning, there is a picture of Donald Trump on the next slide. <laughs> I'm just letting you know. Um, so with big P politics, we need to keep voices attached to citizens in our democracy. Um, despite Donald Trump's demagogic insistence that he literally is our voice. This is New York Times, uh, July 22nd, 2016, front page of NewYorkTimes.com. This is um, right after uh, Trump's acceptance speech at the um, at the RNC convention, um, Trump pledges, the headline is a picture of, of Trump um, sort of smiling in a very large close-up version of him smiling in the background projected on the screen. It says, Trump pledges order and says, I am your voice. Let's think about that though in relation to ways that people with disabilities ha potentially have some quibbles with that. Um, so this is a screenshot from um, CNN's projection of, uh, at the DNC, uh, uh, self-advocate, disabled self-advocate Anastasia Somoza directly responding to Trump's call, saying um, Donald Trump doesn't, um, doesn't, doesn't hear me, doesn't see me, and he definitely doesn't speak for me. 
So this pulling through of ways in which voice is getting used and abused in particular ways, um, it is not something that people with disabilities are, um, they are the ones we, we need to look to and, and draw upon sort of histories of resources in which to grapple with um, the, the uses of language in ways that more often exclude than include. Um, on a technological aspect, um, nowadays, a lot of interest in voice-activated technology. So Surrey, um, uh, Alexa, um, and in some ways those can be really accessible. Um, those can add, if you have motor limitations, other ways to, to access. But um, we have to think about what kinds of voices get picked up. So this is just a headline that says, you know, voice is the next big platform. But then here's another headline from Scientific American, why Siri won't listen to millions of people with disabilities. There are particular ways in which voices are recognized or are not recognized, um, let alone just the kinds of voices that can be produced by a given piece of technology. Um, so ideas about the normal here um, and what it means to have a voice um, are cr more critical considerations. So to wrap up, um, technologies that give a voice to the voiceless can also reproduce structural inequalities. Having a voice and being heard so are not necessarily the same things at all. And they're also not just about technology, but social, cultural, and economic resources, and having access to which is unevenly distributed. Um, and as the, my book, it centers the iPad, but it's interesting because uh, I am really interested in what some people might call an edge case or you know, a sort of outside case, but I really believe that there is something to think about marginalization and participation that, um, that is really actually super central to what we're all trying to get at um, in terms of understanding what it means to, to participate. Um, so we need to keep voices materially attached to people and how we build our technology or else the risk is you know, tantamount to dismantling um, or if you know, we can say that it's the structure of democracy has been stable to begin with, also an open question. Um, but at stake is really not only which voices get to speak, but who's thought to have a voice to speak with in the first place. That's my talk. I'll turn it over now to Liz. Yeah, or yeah. All right, uh, so thank you for having me here today. I'm happy to, thank you, have a chance to talk about this work in conjunction with Merrill's work because we've been uh, batting around some of the same ideas regarding access, voice, participation, uh, and technology and disability. Uh, I've been framing my work as essentially cultural studies of technology, uh, attempting to understand how technologies uh, reflect and reproduce particular dynamics of power and how uh, users of technologies can push back upon those constructions uh, and challenge the sort of received um, ways in which technologies are developed along uh, certain assumptions. I'm going to be actually reading from my phone because I get lost on a large piece of paper. So to start off here, uh, we have some images reflecting a sort of pervasive utopianism in talking about the internet, World Wide Web, and related technologies. Uh, at the top right is an image from MCI's 1997 Anthem commercial. This young person appears speaking in American Sign Language right before text that reads, there are no infirmities. Uh, the Time 2006 Person of the Year was you with a big reflective cover. Uh, and then this bottom photo is a screenshot from a Yahoo advertisement in 2009 called It's You, uh, prioritizing this kind of individual empowerment and excitement around new technologies. Uh, 
At various points, these technologies have been understood as democratizing, globalizing, uh, something that can eradicate racial, gender, and disability difference, uh, and something that can open economic and social opportunities. From the hype of cyberspace to the celebrations of Web 2.0, uh, we see stories of technology are often stories of endless possibility. Uh, in Restricted Access, I'm attempting to intervene in some of these celebrations by investigating digital media accessibility, the processes by which digital media is made usable by people with disabilities, uh, and arguing for the necessity of conceptualizing access uh, in a way that will be more variable and open opportunity in new ways. So, after all, I argue that if digital media only op open up these opportunities to people who are already relatively privileged in terms of their ability to access technology, uh, then their progressive potential remains unrealized, if not simply transformed into a means of upholding those very inequalities. Now, what is media accessibility, web accessibility? Uh, this is something that I often illustrate with this slide, which is just a screenshot of a homepage of the New York Times as run through the Web Accessibility in Minds uh, online accessibility checker. This is an automatic software tool that will check the HTML and associated code of a web page and flag with little red or yellow icons where there might be a problem. So in this case, the page is being flagged for uh, not describing the image that reads New York Times, uh, for not describing the small images, uh, and for uh, having some incorrect form usage. Um, now, accessibility is a fascinating case because it is a very granular process. Essentially, web content accessibility comes out of uh, non-governmental policy sources, such as the World Wide Web Consortium. Uh, it has also been taken up in various legal contexts. So there are laws in the United States that require accessibility in some contexts. Uh, and there are arguments that the ADA requires web accessibility in many contexts. Uh, however, these policies um, are written in a such a way as to facilitate the use of consumer technologies with the kinds of adaptive and assistive technologies that Merrill gestured towards. Things like screen readers, uh, alternative input devices like tongue typers, joysticks. These technologies are often key in allowing people with disabilities to use technology. Uh, and accessibility ensures that software will work with those technologies. However, accessibility generally has to be implemented by individual companies, developers, website operators, uh, and is therefore a highly distributed phenomenon. Um, there's no automatic uh, way of understanding where this happens. Thus, a lot of my research has involved tracking digital media accessibility through the policymakers, uh, people working with the Worldwide World Wide Web Consortium, people working in government, in academic contexts, uh, as well as with developers, consultants, um, sometimes marketing departments are in charge of accessibility, uh, internal standards. A lot of major corporations have their own accessibility standards that are different from what we see in the public sphere. Uh, and so in these terms, accessibility may be understood as highly bureaucratic and technical. Uh, it creates a kind of baseline from which there's the possibility uh, that people with disabilities may then access and use digital media. In thinking about accessibility, however, uh, it's important to think about the terminology because accessibility, like access, uh, is an often used term that is not always attached to these kinds of specialized meanings. Uh, we often see accessibility invoked to refer to new possibilities. Um, the graphical user interface made desktop computing more accessible to a large number of people, even as it very much shut down access for people who were visually impaired. Right? So we see access deployed uh, in various contexts. Uh, and additionally, access to media and information technologies has been addressed in a wide range of academic literatures, uh, from digital divides work to work on public broadcasting, uh, community television, media literacy, uh, and media policy work. Uh, 
but in all of these areas, access is dominantly figured as something that is had. Do you have access? Uh, a sort of unitary and universally desired endpoint. Do you have access? It is good to have access. And in addition to this sort of positive and linear framing, uh, the concept of access is often deployed in such a way as to stand in for availability. You have access to the telephone lines if they connect your house, even if you don't, say, have a telephone. Affordability. Uh, this is a subsidized service in some way, therefore it is more accessible. Uh, or consumer choice. You have access to 590 cable channels, uh, whether you want them all or not. Right? So access is a flexible term. Uh, but when we center disability and accessibility in their specialized senses, uh, the gaps in some of these literatures and usages emerge. In fact, it seems that access is inherently variable, dependent upon bodies, contexts, and a host of other factors. When we say, check Facebook, we're potentially engaged in a wide range of technological and social practices that vary from person to person. As argued by Canadian disability scholar Tanya Tichkowski, quote, every single instance of life can be regarded as tied to access. To do anything is to have some form of access. Thus, rather than think of access as a binary or a linear progression, uh, disability studies encourages us to conceive of it as a continually relationally produced means of engaging with the world. So we don't have access, we are doing access. Now, in restricted access, I use this as sort of a jumping off point for thinking about how then can we study access as an infinitely variable, complicated phenomenon, right? This, this is starting to sound impossible if every construction of access is different. Uh, and thus, I've been using the metaphor of sort of an access kit illustrated here with a sewing kit, with a pair of scissors, some safety pins, needles, a thimble, other things you use for sewing. I'm not a sewer. Um, however, I use this metaphor because I like the idea of a kit in that you can use it all together to do what it's intended for. You can use this to sew. Or you can take pieces and parts and use them differently. You might use the scissors to you know, cut up something in your kitchen. You might use the safety pins uh, to make a punk t-shirt or signal your safety in a post-Donald uh, Trump world. Um, you may recombine these in different ways. And thus, in sort of figuring the access kit, I thought about what are some categories of questions? What are some ways we can dig into access uh, that will allow us to look perhaps through some different lenses at how that access is being created? Uh, and I'm not going to go into detail here, uh, except to say that I sort of loosely grouped these into categories of regulation, use, form, content, and experience, which I can talk about later. Uh, and together, they encourage us to think about access as a relational phenomenon, uh, drawing attention to what a cultural studies perspective might call the articulations of bodies, technologies, institutions, geographies, and social identities. So access is not one thing but many, not an end point, but also not a beginning. Nico Carpentier has referred to access as a precondition for participation. Before we can participate, we must access. Uh, but through the study of digital media accessibility for disability, it's become evident to me that the production of access is an ongoing part of participation in a digitally mediated society. Now, one of my favorite examples in the book is the case of Tumblr. Uh, as some of you probably know, Tumblr is a multimedia microblogging platform uh, that is characterized by the sharing or reblogging of posts across the network, the formation of interest groups, and a lesser emphasis on individual identity display than many social networks. It is, however, populated by user-generated content and thus not obviously bound by the uh, legal and technical requirements faced in government, educational, or e-commerce spaces. Perhaps as a result, Tumblr is formally inaccessible. It is difficult to add alternate text to images, even if you wanted to and knew how. Uh, it features infinite scroll, which can be a challenge for many assistive technologies. Uh, and it uses very limited markup features to indicate importance. Uh, additionally, the content is highly variable uh, and often animated, um, adding additional challenges from an accessibility perspective. So 
from a sort of top-down perspective, the inaccessibility of Tumblr seems like a problem. However, in my work, I've tried to couple the uh, institutional perspective with a more on-the-ground user perspective. I did roughly 25 interviews with disabled users about how they use these technologies and why and what was frustrating. And in these interviews, uh, I've got, on the one hand, people telling me that they contacted Tumblr and talked about the accessibility policies uh, and were just totally rebuffed. Tumblr was not interested in talking to them, did not change anything. However, they also pointed to group pages such as Accessibility Fail and um, F, yeah, accessibility, uh, as other places where they were in fact finding community and using this platform. Uh, in some of these cases, users were um, adopting and adapting Tumblr, sharing experiences of microaggressions, sharing accessibility knowledge, teaching each other workarounds by which to make a site more accessible. Furthermore, this kind of grassroots accessibility uh, revealed some different meanings of access. Uh, and the values associated with it. Uh, while, it ac while accessibility is often thought of as a matter of law, policy, or technology, uh, or the provision of services in a kind of charity model, um, many users were much more likely to talk about it in terms of effective and uh, cultural dimensions. Many prioritized feeling welcomed rather than merely accommodated, or being included as members of a, part of a community rather than as afterthoughts, or having their non-technical needs met. For instance, many disabled Tumblr users praised the site uh, because its large social justice community meant that trigger warnings were commonly used. Uh, trigger warnings, or as we saw with Donald Trump, are a brief indication of when and how content might be upsetting for someone with a particular kind of trauma, uh, and they're well beyond the scope of technological accessibility policy. However, as one interviewee told me, trigger warnings make a site accessible to me, indicating respect for the emotional and social needs that can often accompany disability. Building out of such examples, I end restricted access by talking about cultural accessibility as a means of moving towards a more accessible and just future. This moves beyond sort of technocentric notions of accessibility or accommodation uh, and aims to highlight the interrelationships among technological and economic access, cultural representation and production, and access to community in the public sphere. Uh, not simply universal design, cultural accessibility prioritizes the ongoing perspectives and visibility of people with disabilities, uh, and it may best be achieved through sort of participatory collaborations between users, policymakers, industries, and others. I've illustrated this uh, concluding point with a screenshot of uh, actress Teal Scherer, who created a web series called My Gimpy Life, which she funded through Kickstarter. So already we're seeing sort of a host of contemporary uh, digital media technologies brought to bear. Uh, and in this case, um, Shearer also prioritized disability community and access on screen and off. Uh, the web series had an on-screen credit for the person who produced the closed captioning. Uh, the Kickstarter page developed over time into more of a community space than a fundraising space. Uh, and we see a range of um, relationships and uh, connections forming that potentially enabled the formation of community and the movement into a larger civic and public sphere from inclusive cultural spaces. Ultimately then, I would argue that access is not simply a prerequisite to participation. Access and participation depend upon one another. Uh, just as access enables participation, so does increased participation by diverse people uh, make possible the expansion of access. Uh, and I will wrap it up there so we have some time. Okay, I'm, I'm going to ask, I'm going to start with one question for the three of you and then we can open it up as quickly as possible to Q&A. So it strikes me that all of our work is constantly playing catch up with lived experience. And Ryan, I'm thinking of like your work with Herdict is in some way always trying to close that gap between um, 
lived experiences of blockages or clogs or censorship online and um, the point at which there's greater public awareness about those blockages. And <laughs> scholarship, you know, is by design sort of laggy uh, because of like the time it takes to dwell on things and the time it takes to publish things. So I wonder um, how each of you think about lagginess with regards to lived experience in, in each of your um, projects. And maybe we can start with Ryan, bring you into the conversation. Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, I'll just first preface my response by saying, you know, as Dylan uh, mentioned in, uh, in my introduction, you know, I spend my, uh, my sort of work days thinking about uh, about access to, to, to technology uh, uh, and who controls uh, these sort of uh, uh, elements of, of the web and the internet and, uh, and our technologies. Uh, but uh, from on my, in my personal life, as someone who wears hearing aids, uh, I think a lot uh, sort of in the very specific use case of how that technology uh, enables and uh, limits me personally in in different ways um, and so uh, so I found the the discussion from from Liz and Merrill today really uh, really interesting and and important and so on this question of, of lagginess uh, you know one of the things that really uh, jumps out at me and I think uh, picks up on something that that Merrill was saying was this uh, question of you know, technology uh, reproducing structural inequalities, and uh, and something that I think is uh, is on that that point is, is interesting to me is that uh, I see a lot of of convergence going on in technologies um, that uh, you know that. Uh, as Merrill's example showed, you know that that people can use iPads, which are consumer technologies, to do things that you know earlier might have required you know going through a medical specialist or getting very expensive medical technologies. Um, and you know, in the in the the, the hearing aid market, there's uh, a lot of uh, of movement now to allow companies to sell things that aren't quite hearing aids, but do essentially everything that that a hearing aid could do, uh, and uh, and there's a lot of uh, pros and cons to that approach. You know, there's uh, the potential that it could lower the costs that a lot of people who don't get hearing aids can suddenly get hearing aids, um, but you know, no longer are they having it fine-tuned by a medical professional and, um, and, and all of that. And so as you converge sort of mainstream technology and technology that helps people with, with disabilities, uh, in some ways I think that, uh, that, that you can turn Merrill's question or prompt around and say, you know, in what ways is, is all technology reinforcing uh, societal and structural inequalities? And, you know, to, I think Sarah, Sarah Hendren has talked about how all technology is assistive technology. You know, we're not naturally born with the ability to get our emails on our wrists and, you know, and yet technology enables us to do that. And so, uh, so in what ways is technology that all of us are using in assistive ways uh, reproducing things that maybe we should be taking a closer look at? You know, one example that, that, that comes to mind is uh, how autonomous vehicles uh, are certainly something that, you know, to talk about access, you know, give, can potentially... Uh, allow people who either physically can't drive or you know they're they're too old to drive um, you know allows them to have mobility uh, you know as you know ride sharing services uh, will start using it you know there's the potential to open up access for lots of people and yet ride sharing or autonomous vehicles often rely very heavily on mapping and so parts of the world are simply not mapped and those places don't get access. And so there's an example of where, 
technology uh, taken out of the sort of disability context, but something which you could characterize at, at a very basic level is, is accessibility technology uh, is itself uh, uh, potentially going to reproduce the structural inequalities, the places like the favelas in Brazil that are very heavily populated but are not mapped will not have access to these technologies. And so, uh, so anyway, I'm not quite sure that answers your question about lagginess, but, 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 that's, but that, that, that's at least, you know, I, I think that there's just some bigger questions to me about technology in general and how, uh, how that's reproducing these inequalities. And, you know, and I think it does sort of raise these questions of, you know, from a lagginess perspective that, 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 you know, we have to sort of think of these things in their broader context and not just, you know, in a disability context uh, anymore. I'll just say something very briefly because then I want to make sure that we have time for questions, but just um, talking about lag and delay, um, and that not, you know, whether that's a negative or a positive thing or an inevitable thing. Um, but I w immediately thought of when you brought up, you know, sort of the relational, the act of access, and it's, it is a process and not just a product. Um, thinking about with speech generating devices, that it can take a while to create a message for it to be then output for somebody to say. Um, the, the fluidity with which one might be able to potentially, depending on um, what kind of motor uh, impairment they might or might not have, but the patience that is required for a conversation partner, to even if you've got a technology that works well, it's like top of the line, it's fully charged, um, that's a whole other thing. Um, <laughs> uh, can't talk with a thing that doesn't have any juice. Uh, that the patience that is required of somebody else to um, follow a pace of conversation that might not be a one that they, are, they themselves and they themselves enact or are used to having with another person. Um, so that process, that patience, and that's something that is learned, that is something that um, is something that uh, somebody who doesn't have a speech disability would like have to be able to become better equipped at. So think about the kinds of social and cultural and personal equipment that is needed um, for participation, like that gets sort of added to the, to the list here, um, just thinking about temporality in that way. No, it's just a small comment. Um, I'm from Colombia, and as we are not, I mean, as we don't have that many resources, so we have to come up with uh, creative solutions. Uh, so the main problem in these kind of, of issues is the economy of scale. As the population is, is, is not big, the, the market is not providing solutions for them. So for example, in the case of deaf people, we, we create this relay center uh, with a sign language. So a, a, a person who is deaf could connect through, through an app and, and this uh, remote person can translate from sign language so uh, he can, I mean, the, the deaf person can present an exam or have a consultation with a doctor or I mean, really any kind of communication. So this is one solution of economy at scale. And the other one wa was uh, we, we buy a country license for a screen reader. So... Uh, I think one license is like a thousand dollars per person per year, but if you buy a country license, it's less than one dollar per person per year or per computer per year, because we 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 buy thousands and thousands of licenses, so we can install a license in every internet cafe in every school, for example, uh, and people is not paying. Actually, they are not paying because it's so cheap to to charge for. Uh, but, uh, for example, the schools pays a little bit, and we gather all this money um, and buy a country license, which is tremendously more uh, cheaper than, than uh, buy one by one. Yeah, I, yeah um, I hadn't heard about country licenses. That's really fascinating. I want to know more. Uh, but I will say in terms of scale, we may think about the sort of things that Ryan brought up with mainstreaming as being one way in which 
uh, mainstream technologies are taking on assistive functions, which enables a different kind of scaling. Um, so when we are talking about assistive technologies that are developed as such, uh, they're often very expensive because there's a small market and a lot of research that goes into them. Uh, when those can be deployed in consumer devices, uh, some of those costs go down. Um, but as I think Ryan indicated, sometimes um, oversight goes down as well. You don't have a medical professional adjusting the hearing aids. You, uh, in, I've been doing some research on emergency lately, and you don't really have... Uh, very good connections to 911 when you're relying on an app to dial it for you. Uh, so yeah, there are ways in which that is changing. Um, That's a good question. Yeah. Oh, you guys. So um, I just had a question about uh, the, the differences between adults and kids, and particularly, you know, I think that there's often, you know, uh, talking about voice and voiceless. You know, many times. Uh, you know, kids are voiceless either uh, because they simply aren't at the, you know, emotional or intellectual place where they can, you know, talk about what's going on or because legally, you know, their parents speak for them. And, uh, you know, and I, I know from, from my personal experience when I was like, you know, five or six, like, uh, you know, the last thing I wanted to be doing was wearing hearing aids and, you know, and I didn't want to, you know, people to ask me about them and like, if it was my choice, I would have just taken them out, but luckily it wasn't my choice. Uh, and so, you know, I was wondering if you could talk about some of the differences that you guys have seen, you know, like in particular, you know, you, you, you quoted some parents talking about their experiences. Uh, up there, I'd be interested to hear about how these issues of voice and voiceless and access, you know, uh, are are maybe different or or different challenges emerge when you're dealing with adults versus kids. Yeah. Uh, well, I'll I'll hand this to Marilyn in just a second. I've worked primarily with adults. Uh, and in part, that's because when we are looking at um, disability spaces, there is a, a lot of attention often to K-12 uh, education and to particularly what can be done to help children. Uh, and there's often a drop off in terms of when those children become adults. Uh, and so f by looking at online spaces where people with disabilities were engaging with one another and creating disability culture, uh, I think we, I get an interesting sort of perspective on what happens after that, right, in that sort of less structured space. But obviously, research on kids. Yeah, I mean, I'd say the kid focus is partly just related to my expertise and background more than anything else. And even then, like I, 13 tends to become my, my cutoff. Um, 14 in the US, um, you're supposed to at least federally have a mandate to talk about transition to adulthood. And that's where I sort of stop, even though you can be like 30 and really be into Elmo. Um, and I've talked in my first book, I talk um, in digital youth with disabilities, talk about age appropriateness and sort of the fluidity with which um, sort of radical spaces can potentially be created um, outside of like related to interest or related to different cultural spaces like um, like theater performances that are and um, that have sort of sensory um, inclusivity, um, uh, sort of mixed age, mixed abilities of all different sort of kinds. Um, and I think that with the book, you know, a lot of the research of my, um, in terms of the kids, that there's the parents that are quoted. Um, I think to not overprivilege, while well, the quote is something that I use here, in the book there's a lot of descriptors of like behavior and of interactions with kids and other individuals. Um, I did not have the, the skill to um, to interview some of the, the kids in terms of um, their capacity to use, because some of these kids were not using, the, the whole point was that they didn't have a, a reliable access to communication. Um, and so the challenges of then doing that work um, outside of um, like, like di triangulating different sort of behaviors in different kinds of expressions or vocalizations or you know, excitements um, uh, in, in kinds of spaces. Um, I would say that for like my next book project, which is focused on the experiences of autistic youth growing up in the digital age um, and different kinds of ways in which communication happens, um, I'm, I'm grappling with that right now in terms of the interviews that I'm doing with, with directly with kids, um, the ways that I talk with them about their media practices, but again, the ways in which some of that is oral and some of that is not. And so part of that is sometimes the challenge of presenting field work to an audience and the legibility of that um, uh, as opposed to just sort of having a video 
or um, another kind of recording. So that sort of gets at like our methods and the ways in which we then like make our our research or our evidence visible, um, and the ways in which certain kind of visibilities can um, unintentionally privilege or reflect certain ways in which the, the research was or was not um, conducted. But yeah. Hi, um, I have a one comment about the giving voice to the voices. I really like the point about how voices is seen as uh, a mean for agency and self-presentation. And I was just thinking about if you change a headline to something different, uh, instead of giving voice to the voices to something like listen to the unlistenable, it'll be a totally different like focus on, like, on instead of on the person who 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 needs to be given a voice so it won't be on we have of us to train our listening capacity. So that's also I don't know whether you've thought about that. Yeah, so listening and speaking and the dynamics between those things are something that I talk about more in the book. Um, and that gets a little bit to, there's a phrase I really, really love, a media um, justice scholar, Tanya Dreyer, talks about the partial promise of voice. So voice is incompletion, um, the partiality of it, the um, to fully say that we have any kind of grasp or pin downable you knowness of it because that, that understanding of respect um, of, of, of a message being acted on um, and a promise being kept. Um, and that's kind of partly in like larger public sphere discussions, but I think that, th that that point about listening, whether one is able to be listened to or not, again, there, that's a, we can t think about that in terms of like a biological individual level, a social level, a political, you know, what the mechanisms are for feedback, um, but also some of that can also reinforce who's in power in the first place. Um, and in what ways can that still enforce a an, uh, an us them a you know a powerless a, you know again an essentializing idea of having and not having of giving and not giving? Hi, um, I I have a comment and a question. Um, I had the great pleasure and. I will say some humility. About 10 years ago, I was teaching at Northeastern for adults, and one of my students was a 74-year-old blind man who lost his sight at 32. And I learned like a day in the life of someone who has disabled, you know, is disabled. And I had to rearrange my entire how I was going to structure um, uh, an exam because we were in a computer classroom, and he had to go in a special room. And if they didn't have the jaws, then they would have. I would have to work with the Northeastern Disability Office to have someone come and have a reader read the exam to him. And I learned something of the Massachusetts Disability. I say, oh, just go to the bookstore and get a volume six or version six of the you know the book for the class. And the the one they had for the Braille was like version three. You know things like it's a very you know, things that we just take for granted. It's just very humbling. Uh, another t a time I was at an event where um, there's a company, I will not play it up, but it was Three Play Media. They had an event at the faculty club where they were talking and saying that many times when they have events here or classes, they have closed captioning. And they said many times foreign students to help them learn English are using it. So that's like the number one reason in addition to disability. So my question here is, you know, we're in an area where we have so many startups, and just like until recently, cybersecurity and writing secure code is an afterthought. It's like, yeah, we'll do it later. Disability for many places is like, yeah, yeah, whatever, if, you know, if it's not in education or government. Is there anything that can be done to teach, um, like, the CS students that are coming out now, of course, six at MIT, at here at Harvard, the people who are, before they start their careers, to incorporate it in the design so it's not, yeah, yeah, for those, you know, let's take and make it as part of how you learn how to create. So you will not have these incredible disparities yeah. in, yeah. you know, accessibility. One, one thing I would say is to read um, histories of people with disabilities as actors in the history of the development of computing. Um, so the idea of that it's more like, you're not adding on disability, you're adding, like the recovery of individuals with disabilities in computing history um, or engineering history um, uh, is really central, I think, to that idea of not developing a sort of charity model of, of disability pedagogy in a field like CS. <laughs> 
And I'll just add to that. I've done some work on how uh, web accessibility was explicitly an afterthought in teaching web development for many, many years in the sense that it would be the last chapter of the book, right? Once you've learned how to do everything else, maybe you'll look at this, but maybe you, you probably won't. Um, and that's something that's borne out actually in a lot of computer studies curriculum. They don't have courses on accessibility and basic lessons don't incorporate it as something that you do as part of the process. Uh, the International Association of Accessibility Professionals is a young organization, uh, maybe four or five years old now, uh, that's explicitly attempting to address that by making some sort of best practices for CS education uh, and offering some certifications for people who have um, actual training in accessibility uh, to use once they go out into the job market. Uh, and then, of course, there's a whole world of universal design and design for disability uh, and design literatures focused on how to incorporate um, diverse users at an early stage. I was just going to say uh, uh, that, that I'm actually somewhat optimistic in this sense right now because I think that you know when you look at things like like wearable technologies and there's uh, so much more focus right now in the mainstream, and I think this gets back to sort of this convergence point. There's so much more focus right now on human-machine interactions and artificial intelligence, and a lot of the technologies that are necessary to make, you know, wearables better, uh, to make, uh, you know, augmented reality better, to make autonomous vehicles better, you know, like uh, the improvements that have been made uh, over the last several years in uh, computer vision technology. Like all of those things uh, I think will help on this lagginess question that I think it's uh, as more technology and these startups are thinking more about how machines interact with the physical world, they're solving some of these problems that maybe have traditionally been you know, the sort of afterthought problems uh, and they're not approaching it in the, the mindset of how do we solve problems for people with disabilities, but I think the applications are getting closer and closer to uh, so so that it's not such a leap to figure out oh we designed this thing now we have to figure out how to apply it uh, in a whole new context. But it's actually like oh you know we now have something that can identify what's going on in this room because we need it for our artificial intelligence technology, and that makes it super easy to design something for someone with a visual impairment. So I'm optimistic on that. So uh, just a quick comment on that last bit. There is an industrial thing that's called Teach Access, if you do a web search on this, that's a, um, a consortium of a number of the big um, companies are trying to put together curricula to distribute throughout a bunch of universities for specifically integrating it into the CS curriculum. Um, there's a lot of trouble there because a lot of the industries are trying to hire people and nobody knows anything about it. And so this is actually a pull from industry to try to be able to, to key that up a little bit. So it's something to look at. So I, I just had a question. You know, a lot of the, the regulatory issues and the policy issues in um, accessibility have to do with things around um, either livelihoods or access to government services or these things that are really very instrumental in sort of getting things done in your life, right? And I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to issues around entertainment or just sociality of just interacting because as much more of our lives become mediated, then the access to these things become much more critical to just, just our lives. And I don't see as much discussion of that in a lot of the disability discussion. I think the place where you see the most discussion of that sort of thing is in uh, captioning, uh, particularly in the past several years as Netflix captioned its content, uh, both the activism around that and then the 21st Century Communication and Video Accessibility Act, right, uh, took some steps towards prioritizing that kind of access. Uh, but I think it's a really interesting question to think about content and what we're gaining access to uh, and making sure that you know access to video games and access to pornography are still kinds of access. Uh, 
Uh, and people with disabilities are not less entitled to things that we think are morally dubious um, than are other people. So there's certainly some tension there, right? Because government doesn't want to get into that if they can avoid it. Um, but I'm encouraged because I see that that's also happening in informal ways. Um, Major League Baseball did a, what's called a structured negotiation where instead of a lawsuit, they worked with uh, disabled community members to make uh, websites and streaming baseball games more accessible. Uh, and so that's something where I, the mandate for MLB to be accessible is not really there, but through some processes of introductions and um, collaboration, you can actually get to places where that content is being uh, addressed, um, but it's very much not from the W3C. I'll just say, you know, very briefly, there's a chapter in the book that's about um, centering on, like, the, qu the question is, like, what is an iPad for? Um, and that there were these um, real tensions around whether an iPad was for that app exclusively um, or whether it was also for all of the other things that any other person might use it for. And that, you know, a lot of things that were related to issues around taste, um, related to issues of ownership, um, uh, the idea of whether you had multiple different of those pieces of hardware to delineate and make distinctions between which of those things are for. But it, for me, like the real lightning strike in that was I was at, you know, doing an observation and uh, the speech pathologist I was with like had very negative things to say about YouTube, um, even though it was clearly this thing that the kid enjoyed that motivated them to use this app in the first place to communicate. But there was lots of values about um, well, kids and their iPads and their YouTubes um, uh, <laughs> and, as, and, and like a shutdown. Um, and the ways in which that particularly extra marginalized families who maybe didn't have access to, um, or the ability to mobilize resources, I want to also phrase it as that way, around, the, around English language, mobilize resources around um, community members who had other kinds of access to other kinds of resources, social capital, um, the cultural capital to push back against that person um, in any way. So yes, yeah, so the idea, of, especially because an iPad, like, is a consum like design was designed to be a consumption technology, not necessarily for creation um, uh, and somewhat for circulation. But just thinking about the the people who people wanting to take advantage of like all of these things that that can be done, but some of the professional pushbacks around again like sort of expertise and you know it's it's a mainstream technology, but it entered the home like through the teachings of somebody with a professionalization, um, you know, certain sort of things attached to that. So. Yeah. More of that in the book. <laughs> okay, thanks everyone. Again, there are, oops. <laughs> I'll just say there are books for purchase at the back of the room, and thank you so much for coming out. Um, Liz and Meryl and Ryan will be here. Um, now, a round of applause for our guests. <laughs>